Solomon has been made king. And I think it's an interesting point that Solomon is the son of David, but he's also the son of Bathsheba. If you remember from the story, Bathsheba was the one that uh, David took after uh, he sent her husband off to war and got him killed. And, uh, but if you follow that story, one might, might be concerned and, and step back and say, well, this guy was mean. He did things that he shouldn't have been doing. But continue reading and you find out that God in his own way changed the man and gave him responsibility so that he had a much better reputation later on in life. So now, we start out by hearing that my scripture says David has now gone to sleep with his relatives. I thought about that. In translation, he died. And Solomon, and there was a dispute in the family uh, as well at the time, just before he died, because he called Solomon and made him uh, the next king. And Solomon had an older brother who, by the standards of the time, should have been placed in the position of king. And so there was irritation and what have you then, but Solomon came into the uh, place of being king early in his life and uh, with great responsibility. And, and as you read the scripture, you hear him say, uh, first God comes to him. Now, I like that picture. You haven't been asleep and had a dream and you think, who is that? And then, and, and you wonder if it's God speaking to you because you're getting direction. You know, I mean, in today's world, if we jump up and say, hey, I had a dream last night and I was talking to God, and they're going after you real quick. <laughs> but it happens. It happens. And the only problem is we don't often respond to it because it, it feels strange to us in the society that we live in kind of puts that kind of thing down. But Solomon listened. And he heard God say, ask, and I'll give it to you. Whatever you want. Now, it seems to me if uh, a lot of folks, I won't point any fingers or anything, but a lot of folks, uh, somebody once said when you point your fingers at others, you got a uh, Three others coming right back at you, but um, if you if you listen to this uh, and think about it, most folk would say, "Give me riches, give me power, give me direction, give me give me all these things that'll make me very important before the people, and that I can have a good life." And he says, "Give me wisdom, give me respect for others." Give me a heart of understanding. He said, I am just a child. And it's interesting that somebody in that position can still feel himself as not a leader, but a child. And that's an indication that they are overwhelmed. He probably was very grateful that God came in and spoke to him that night and said, what is it you need? What is it you want? Because if you ask, I will give it to you. And in the course of the conversation, uh, God says to him, you did not ask me for riches. You did not ask me uh, for uh, a powerful position. You did not ask for the things, basically, that I would expect you to ask for. You asked for wisdom and a heart that is sensitive to other people around you and the, the armies and the area that you'll be governing. And so, with that in mind, I'm going to give you the opportunity to yes, 
have the wisdom in your heart to be a person who can reach out to others, to be someone who is understanding. Someone who is understanding is a great asset to a community because they listen. They, they want to know what others are thinking before they project into them their thoughts and usually they come by, back with affirmation rather than being instruction. When you listen to a lot of conversations, somebody says this is the situation the person they're talking to is very busy getting an answer up before they even finish what they say they, this is the situation. And so we miss something there. God was saying, this is the way it is, Solomon. And now you look at Solomon's journey, and, um, well, in fact, just in part of the prayer and the discussion with God, he says that David was a man, an upright man, a faithful man, your servant. That gave me hope, because when I look at David's journey, I said, God didn't throw him aside when he made a few mistakes. God kept him on board, kept giving him direction, got the things done that the community needed, gave him the vision to change the community, to give the community hope. And then he passes on and he, he Solomon wants basically the same thing. And out of that, God also says to him, because you didn't ask for all these material things, I'm going to give you some. And if you read the history of Solomon, you find that he became a very rich man, a very powerful man. A man who uh, had the gift of uh, taking care of things around him. And the one thing that I am reminded of is that he built the temple. Solomon's temple. He wrote, he wrote um, Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, the Psalms of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. Think of how, how busy, you know you get people saying, I am so busy. And I think of Solomon and he was really working it over. Because I think you'll find this interesting. He wrote seven, uh, 3,000 Proverbs. Now that in itself takes a lifetime. Come up with that many problems. And he wrote 1,005 songs. The Songs of Solomon. And Ecclesiastes, you read Ecclesiastes, and it's full of the words of love. You read uh, about what love is. You ever hear somebody trying to describe love? <clears throat> I can remember back in my undergraduate days when I was taking public speaking, a young lady got up and did a whole speech on what love was. And when she sat down, we still didn't know it. Because <laughs> you can't describe it, you can only feel it. And that, that's what we feel in the Spirit of God when He pours it out on us, is that love. Don't try to describe it. Just enjoy it and celebrate. And that's what Solomon was doing after his conversation with God as he worked around that community, as he was there for them, and he, as he called Hiram to build that temple and design that temple and put it where, as, as God's house. Think about that. He was a gifted man. And it came out of being humble. You know, that's, that's a hard thing to do. Especially if you stop feeling that you are somebody. Uh, and God calls us to be humble. Not to be bragging, but to be humble. And to do the work of God. Well, I don't suggest that you go out and write another 3,000 Proverbs. Uh, but I think it's good to think about what, you, what you're saying. I think it's good to think about how things can be and that we keep on moving forward in this community and in this church in the name of Jesus Christ as servants of God. And don't take it upon ourselves to say, look at me, what is it that they say, don't stand in the marketplace and beat your chest as you pray because it, it uh, won't do you any good. Put you at risk. 
But be there and pray quietly. Be a quiet person in the name of God in your community. Be an example of what God would have you to be. If you make a mistake, it doesn't mean you're thrown away forever. It means you made a mistake. And you humble yourself before God and you acknowledge the mistake and you have that great thing called forgiveness. How many people I have heard in my journey that have said, I'm not going to heaven. God wouldn't want me there. I let them think about it for a while. There was one guy, um, I can't remember the father who was writing that wrote the book, but I took some studies under him when I was not in Florida. And he was telling about this young man that came in to see the minister. And um, he said, you know, I have done a terrible thing. He said, and I can't forgive myself. What did you do? He talked about he had the pain and so on and so forth. Well, probably he had a tough time getting his wife to forgive him, but he was busy trying to forgive himself, but couldn't. He said, I, it's just so terrible, I can't, I just can't forgive myself. Finally, the minister says, um, God forgives you. He said, I know, I know, I know, but I can't forgive myself. He waits a while. And this is a true story. He said, but God forgives you. And he said, but I can't forgive myself. But he said, God forgives you. And the guy finally slid back in his chair and he says, yes, but I have a much higher standard than God. <laughs> Forgive yourselves if you think you've done something wrong. Be serious about it. Be a quiet voice in your community, an example in your community. <clears throat> Celebrate quietly that you can reach souls. And don't ever call someone unchurched. Because in this society, if we believe what we preach, if we believe the scriptures, the Spirit of God is with everyone. And when that Spirit is upon them, they're in that spiritual moment. I've often said to folks, when I hear them say, well, I'm not very religious, I say there's a difference between religious and being spiritual. I'm probably getting trouble with this one. <laughs> I say, we do religion. We are spiritual. And we are in the name of the Father, the Son, 